So basically, it's multiverse laryngoplasty versus bypass uh, surgery. Uh, okay, next, please. And uh, where did it all start? Now, if you go right back, right, right back, 3000 BC, uh, India is right there. Uh, that's the time when uh, bladders used to be catheterized with hollow tubes. And this is the basis on which the whole thing started. And you ask me now, uh, as what well, did originate some, somewhere far ago in India. And then following on, they were using hollow reads in, in Egypt to look at cadavers looking at glass. Next, please. Uh, and then there's a big gap. Nothing much happened until the 1700s when Hales first used brass and glass tubes and measured cardiac pressure. Uh, the poor horse there was for, you know, they used horses at the time and, you know, tricky of a goose to, to measure pressures. Uh, 1844, Bernard for the first time coined the term cardiac catheterization, first ever time when this was used. Next, please. Uh, these are great men. These are some of the great, great men of coronary angiogram angioplasty. I mean, we kind of don't talk much about them now, but I think it's very important that we remember these people. Dr. Forsman, uh, he was a physician in Austria, and in 1929, people thought it wasn't safe to put anything inside the heart. If you didn't put anything inside the heart, you would die. And he wanted to prove that you could put a tube inside the heart and you would live. And he used to self catheterize He anesthetized himself, passed a very thin tube all the way up to the atria, and walked down to the radiology department, took an x-ray, just to prove that the x-ray, the tube was in the heart, uh, and he was dismissed for his, uh, for his efforts. Uh, I think he tried this for about 17 times. I mean, he lost all the weights in the arm. Uh, he couldn't do it anymore. But in 1956, many, many years down the line, he received the Nobel Prize for his great discovery. Because after that, people started putting tubes and measuring pressures. And then comes the next big, uh, you know, next great man, Dr. Soames, physician in Taylor Clinic, pediatric cardiologist, uh, to be honest. He was measuring pressure across the aortic valve because by that time it had become pretty common. And the catheter, while they were injecting, uh, jumped into the coronary artery, the right coronary artery, uh, and 30 ml of contrast went down the coronary artery, and then people were all, you know, they were waiting for the patient to fibrillate and die. Nothing happened. The patient was well. And purely, purely by accident, angiogram was discovered. So it wasn't somebody, you know, going for it and finding it. It was just an accidental discovery. So that was Dr. Soames. And then, the next one, please. And then comes Dr. Charles' daughter. Now, he's actually a radiologist, peripheral. And he, again, you know, he's an, uh, a gentleman who, for the first time, used tubes to open up blocked arteries. Uh, he was very unpopular with the surgeons. Uh, you know, because for time immemorial, people used to think if you had a blocked artery, you have to cut, cut it open and then stitch the thing. He proved percutaneously, he passed different sized tubes, gradually opened up the artery for the first ever time in history, brought about transluminal angioplasty. Uh, of course, he did it in the peripheral arteries, but yes, this was the first time this was attempted. Next, please. And now we come to the father of angioplasty, a great, great, great man. I don't know how many greats I can add to the front of his name. If you look at the abstract behind it, for the first time in Miami in 1975, this abstract was put up. All the Americans are astonished. And here's this guy, you know, classical moustache guy from Europe, talking about a very strange treatment. You put a balloon into a coronary artery, you dilate it, and that works. Uh, people didn't believe him and they thought, you know, he was some sort of psycho from Austria, one of those Europeans, mad Europeans. But see what happens. Next slide, please. 1977, September 16th, in Zurich, the uh, first, first human patient had angioplasty, had a balloon treatment. This was a discrete proximal stenosis in the LA. And he also had surprisingly informed consent. Gunzik walked in along with the surgeon and they explained that for the first time in the world you're going to be the first human, we're going to try this out on you, and if it fails, you'll be rushed to emergency bypass. This guy, like businessman, took it on and said yes, and he's very famous now. He goes around uh, the world talking uh, to different people. In fact, he was in uh, Mumbai not so long ago, uh, in 2005, really, I can't remember. Uh, but, you know, he's become very famous, Mr. Backman. Next, please. And this is just to point out what the first angioplasty did. These are actual, actual pictures. You can find them on the web. I'm just going to go point them out. That is the nerve in the artery. 
that's the Navi in the RC on the 60 when it was treated. So, thank you. This here on the 20th, so a few days after they put the balloon in, just a plain balloon, opened it up, went back and had a look. The four days down the line looked fine. And then 10 years down the line, just to see how it looked. So they went back and had a look, and look at that, that was just, just plain old balloon. And 10 years down the line, it still looks good. So this, this, this was great for a new plastic. Next please. And this is, what, this is the balloon that they used. Uh, he used to get rubber from a shoe factory nearby. So Mr. Grant, Dr. Bernsley and his wife sat in the kitchen, fashion catheters and balloons. Took a long time, but you know, that's how great people are. Uh, great things happen in the kitchen, I suppose. Next one. Uh, and rapidly, within the next few weeks, he had two, three, four patients. Uh, and look at the kind of selection. One patient left me, one multiversal, another left me. Now we talk about these things as if this is something great that we do nowadays. But Andreas did all this in the 70s, early. Uh, and then on and on and on. And you know, he, he had 169 patients within the year. Next please. Uh, yes, there were complications with the balloon. The balloon opened up the artery, but then the vessel closed again, sometimes abruptly. So he took the patient back to the recovery room. And within the first 24 hours post-recovery, that was a crucial period. Because 25% of patients used to have to be rushed for emergency bypass. And this gave angioplasty a very bad name. Nobody thought it would survive. Next, please. Uh, this is basically what used to happen. If you can look here, I won't go, I won't go into the details, but the Arctic doesn't look very pretty after you've ballooned it. Next, please. And then that's when stents came along. And I just put in the picture to show how small they are, two millimeters, three millimeters. And what they did was they stopped this abrupt closure within the first 24 hours. But there was a new problem. You're putting in a foreign body, stainless steel stuff. And the blood doesn't like foreign bodies when it's flowing. So people used to get thrombosis. So you stop the vessel closing suddenly, but then you got clots happening within the first week, subacute, and then they still had to go for emergency bypass. So still not very good. Next, next please. Uh, so basically this is what a stent does. It's just a scaffold, and after you balloon the thing, the, the scaffold opens up and keeps your artery open. And then you take the whole thing out and paper store the vessels open. Next please. Uh, I won't talk about this, but uh, Dr. Jack Spiel and Ulrich Sigvart in Tulu used the stent for the first time, uh, called wall stents. Then came Palmer's shafts. I'm sure many of us are familiar with that. Fantastic stents, but they're not obviously used anymore. 1994, first time FDA approved these stents. 1997, 1 million PCIs. The most number of medical intervention, medical intervention anywhere in the world. Next, please. And this is what the older sense, the plain stainless steel sense used to look like. Next please. Uh, but then they looked at it, you know, obviously you've got to look at this thing scientifically, so you did some studies and it wasn't looking good. I mean, you put, they looked at one small study, 117 stents were put in, and look at that, 20 patients had complete occlusion. Uh, you know, it's not good for any new therapy. Next one please. Uh, same for another one, a different type of stent, again, bad news for stents. Next please. So this is basically what happens. This is how the physiology, the, the vessel is after angioplasty in stent. Just, just to explain. So that's plain balloon angioplasty. You damage the intima and the media. Platelets clots form inside and just around the intima. And then you have new intima formation. It's just the healing response. Same thing happens with stents, but the only difference is we got these stents that's here. And they produce long-term strain on the vessel wall, so the de-antima formation uh, many months down the line is much more severe. Next, please. Uh, but ultimately, there are a lot of comparisons between balloons and stents, and uh, you know, basically with stents, your cerebral stenosis came down to by about 10%. Next, please. Uh, this, I think, one of the gentlemen here, uh, we're talking about OCT, optical coherence tomography. This is what it looks like. It's a, it's a latest technology, latest amazing technology. You put a wire inside the artery and look at the artery from inside. And OCT can has a resolution of 10 microns. So basically, these stents can be seen, the struts can be seen. The technology that was predating this was called IOS, ultrasound. I'm sure many of us have heard of IOS. But that has a resolution of only 100 microns. So basically, this is a lot, lot clearer. It, puts out light and collects the reflected light and that information becomes a picture. 
And now just to show you that the diabetic in, in A, of course got a bad mental strength, he had one done five years ago, and look at the amount of reach that that come back, significant. You should never put a bad mental strength in a diabetic. You put in bad mental strength in a diabetic in the case of death, they call it. So I would rather send the patient to surgery rather than put a bad mental strength. If the patient cannot afford a regular insulin, he should have you know, the option of surgery rather than a uh, band mental stent. Now, at the bottom, C, he is a diabetic with a regular stent. And if you look at the narrowing, there is hardly any. So, this is the basic difference uh, with regular stents versus band mental stents. Next, please. And I am sure we all remember, I don't know if uh, you know, many of us might remember, 2002. Was a, was a great year for angioplasty. That's the first time the viral study came, uh, and serious. And for the first time ever, a medical intervention was shown to sh was shown to have complete effect, uh, where the, the narrowing was zero percent at six months. Never ever, nothing else in the medical world has done this. Next please. Uh, same thing for by taxes, and again zero percent narrowing at six months. FDA very rapidly approved them, 2003, 2004, very quick. Next please. And by the way, 2007, I think 2 million patients on Cypher. Happened very quickly. Uh, I'll just put the same slide again to emphasize. And this, by the way, is the IVUS. That's how IVUS looks, and that's how OCT looks. I'm sure you can compare the difference between the two, and the way you can see a thin strut. Here also you can see it, but you know, the whole picture is a bit fuzzy. But iOS can penetrate more. OCT cannot cannot penetrate as much as sound for obvious reasons. But it gives a much better picture. Next please. And now there were some concerns. Okay, the regular distance was in, everything was great, no range stenosis. I'm sure we're gonna put services out of the job. Yes, fine. But 2006 there was a scare in Euro PCR. People started talking about stents clotting up very late, after a year, six months to a year, later than that. This was happening in high risk patients, and uh, some were actually, you know, but, but while they were having MI, they were not all dying. Next, please. So there was a lot of changes with the regular stents. With the regular stent, you have a bare metal on which is a polymer on which sits the drug. So the drug gets out within one to three months, and then you have just the polymer left. And this polymer was the culprit because it made stents flop uh, in six months to one year. So people started thinking, do we have to have a polymer which is non-absorbable? Let's put in a bioabsorbable one. So now we got bioabsorbable stents. What it means is it's a bioabsorbable stent, a bioabsorbable polymer on it on which sits the drug. So the drug is there for three to six months while the vessel is healing slowly. And once the healing takes place, the drug is gone. At the same time, the polymer is gone as well, and the endothelium covers the bioabsorbable stent. So you have all the good bits for the bioabsorbable stent without the bad bits. So essentially, uh, that's what a bioabsorbable stent does. Now we have the four generation stents coming. These are called fully bioabsorbable. These are made of polylactic acid. You put in a stent, go back 18 months down the line, the stent isn't there. But it's been there long enough to make the vessel heal. And the great, great advantage of this is the vessel can still contract and relax, like a normal vessel. And you can go back and you can put as many stents as you want, and they will get absorbed. So I think once this comes in, I think, yes, Surgeons will have to be a bit careful. Next, please. Uh, this is just to talk about the second generation sense. We got some fantastic sense now. The struts are much thinner. You can get them to any RP that you like. The, the drugs are much, much better, and the polymers are better. Next, please. Uh, these are the newer ones. These are the latest stents that we use. Uh, these are the only ones that we use, I use, in New York. Uh, I, I don't think using anything earlier than this generation, uh, you know, uh, it's just not on, to be honest. You need to advise the patient, yes, these are costly, but these are the right sense for you. If you can't afford it, go for surgery. Next, please. Uh, I'll just pass through that. This is just, just to show that the stent struts, right at the other end, the cipher, it was 140 micron. That was the size of a strut. Now it's about 80 micron. That's why you can get it down to any artery. The combination, the alloys, it's gone from stainless steel to cobalt chromium to platinum chromium, and the kind of design of the cell has changed a lot. Uh, just let's, let's just say it's all got a lot, lot better. Right, next, please. Uh, and the same scar people came back in Euro PCR and showed that with regular extent, your risk of race is about 50% less. Next, please. Uh, but there are problems with polymers. Just to go back to the third generation, the ones that I showed, they are good sense, but the polymers.
because it's still an issue. Uh, polymer, when you had to coat it, you had to use laser to coat it. It didn't always do the job properly. Polymers were sticking to each other. A lot of other issues. Polymer got, got off the thing when you were taking it, handling it. And that's when they brought in the bioabsorbable ones. Next please. Uh, so this is third generation stems, bioabsorbable stems. So you have the bioabsorbable polymer looking at the vessel wall and uh, you, you got bare metal on the luminous side. Uh, and as I told you, polylactic acid is what's used now. Next please. And now the fourth generation stems, uh, as I told you, fully bioabsorbable. They are used biolemus. Polylactic acid is the base on which they are uh, deposited. And the vessel, the main main advantage is it recovers its vasoactive function. So 18 months down the line, your coronary vessel is back to what it was. You haven't got surgery, you haven't got a scar in your chest, you haven't got, you know, a bad metal sitting in there, you've got nothing. It's back to normal. I think this is fantastic news for us. Uh, and it's about six months down the line, they're going to be here. Next please. Uh, these are some of the earlier bioabsorbers since. Next please. Uh, this is one of the early ones, Igaki Tama is not available anymore, next please. Uh, this, this stand is very much in the reckoning, I think it's going to be a winner, next please. This is just the same thing, OCT image again. Uh, if you just look at it, you can see the stand strut on the image on the left, I'll just show it to you. This one here, these ones here, reflecting here, the stand strut here, here. It looks like that because it's, it's healing, it's inflammation. You can still see it here. You can see it very well at 9 months. But 12 months it's gone. So, well, 15 months almost gone. 18 months it's gone. So, as I told you, it's going, going, gone. 18 months it's all gone. Next please. Um, now this was just about a bit about how heart disease affects it. Yeah, I think this is something that you know, all of us know much. So I'm not going to concentrate on this. Let's just say uh, it's causing, uh, 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 it's, it's lessening our productivity, it's killing a lot of our people quite early, and heart disease is an epidemic in India. Now, next please. Uh, next please. Uh, we all know the diabetes and heart disease, the coronary vessels don't look pretty. Next please. Uh, next please. This was just very early, uh, very, very early studies looking at bypass versus balloon. Yes, bypass did do better, but that's because we're using just the balloon. Next please. Uh, go back one slide. Uh, this is just to show there lots and lots of early studies, 90s, early 90s, 94, 95, 96, uh, all showed a difference. But yes, not completely though. Next please. And basically this was, a, if you remember, this was either no sense, no glycoprotein, you know, no real pro, no integral, none of that, no antiplatelets. We have all of that now. Uh, next please. And uh, some of the earlier trials, sorry, sorry. Uh, uh, some of some of the earlier trials as well. If looking at bypass patients, the if you look at the survival rate in three years of disease, it's very good compared to you know, if you look at bypass and regular patients, they are equal. Next please. Uh, there have been some mega mega trials now looking at current uh, generation regular patients and bypass and regular patients do as well and better than bypass surgery. Next please. I'm afraid that none of these things are going to show. I don't know if you want to click and try. No? Okay. It's a pity. Uh, I'll just tell you the story. This was an Iraqi chap who came across to us. Uh, injection fraction of 15%, so basically poor LV. Seen by our surgeon. And our surgeon is you know, one of the best in the city. He takes on very high risk patients and he gets very good results. So I would have no trouble referring anybody that high risk patients to him. But he declined to operate. He did infection of 15 and he had other issues as well, liver and renal. Usually not, not good for, for surgery. You put them on the table and they may not leave the table alive. Next please. Uh, just keep going right to the end also. But basically what we did, we looked at the viable myocardium. We've done PCI, he's had stents put in, drug coated stents. He went back to Iraq in two days' time. Uh, so far he's doing well. And uh, I don't know if you might have seen the newspapers uh, many months ago now, Iraqi lady uh, from northern Iraq did want surgery. She had triple surgery, but just said no. No Amelia, La Amelia, which means no surgery. And uh, she ended up with six stents. She's doing fantastic. And she's happy, she's ended up with a small incision in her groin which disappeared in a week. Allowed her to fly back home in a week, 
or two days actually, rather than having major, major surgery done. And the reason why we can do all this stuff is because we have these modern scents. In the modern era, with the code scents, the older indication for bypass surgery, two vessel, three vessel, osteoporosis already is all obsolete. That is all out of the window. Uh, and in the West, we don't do these things anymore. 80% go for angioplasty, and that's the way things are going to go in India. So, but of course, there's the economic side of things. The bypass surgery is 2 lakhs. If you want to put 3, 4, 5 cents, it's going to be something like 3.5 to 4 lakhs. So, I think that is an issue. But for patients who want good quality of life, who don't want major surgery, say for somebody, if you had an elderly aunt or an elderly uncle who wants something done, but you know you wouldn't really want to send them for major surgery, angioplasty is the answer. And the same for anybody who doesn't want surgery, angioplasty is definitely the answer. One has to remember, grafts also approve. Your graft patient is 80% at 8 to 10 years. With these modern stents, we are talking less than less, one person with stenosis. So this is far, far better. Next please. Keep going all the way down. Uh, I think that's most of it to be honest. I think you know there are some slides about the taxes and syntax trials. Basically the trials show that with recruiting stents you are so as good and in some cases, uh, especially in the uh, patients who had one, two vessel disease, very focal, very easily done by angioplasty, they have better results with angioplasty rather than the surgery. Thanks very much. See, if a patient comes to your hospital and within 90 minutes uh, go to lab, uh, lab within 90 minutes, uh, you have uh, done the uh, angiogram right. and you found that four or five blocks are yes. different uh, diseases. Yes. And uh, you will be doing the regulating uh, only in uh, one block or in all the best. Okay. In an acute situation, the story is completely different. Yes. We will do, depending on the artery that is giving him the trouble at the time, excuse me, whichever one he is having the MI from, whether the LAD circle or right coronary, only that artery will be dealt with. The current guideline is that you do not intervene on the other arteries at the time. You have to let, just intervene, open up the artery that you went in for, then go back six weeks down the line and then have a chat with the patient what needs to be done and what the patient wants. 